this isn't just your own personal bullet time rate, is it? <laughs> no, not this one. <laughs> so, uh, tell me, what, how many cameras are here and what the hell is this thing for? We use it for 3D body scanning, uh, actors, stuntmen, all those kind of guys we see in and out of here all the time right. for costume making. There are about 129 cameras on here, I think, at the moment. And, and this, is, this is your process for replacing the full body cast in terms of making costume parts on actors. Yeah, sure. So there was a time where that was the norm. We yeah. used to do that. Yeah. It's a big deal for anyone to go through. Um, Not only is it a big deal for people to go through, it's claustrophobic, they might have reactions, and yeah. these are movie stars. You're, yeah. you're often scanning some of the most famous people in the world. Yeah, uh, we don't get a lot of time with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they can come in here, stand in the middle. It generally, you know, it, it's over in seconds, you know, and, right. and they're gone, so. Now, this is 120 cameras. They all take photos of the actor. What, what do you then do with that data? 120 cameras worth of data is all pour off of here into some central machine <laughs> that processes it? What is, what is the process? Yeah. So it's a process that's changing all the while, so this is, I don't know what version of this, evolution of this rig it is, we're probably four or five versions in from what we built originally. Oh wow, so you've so, already iterated yeah. this and upgrading it all so the time. pushing the data is actually one of the trickier parts of it because USB kind of can get bottlenecked really quick and there's a, you know, these are high res cameras right. and then, you know, 120 cameras simultaneously trying to push data down one wire into a computer just wouldn't work. So. Yeah. Uh, this one, I think, has six blade computers under the stage there. Oh, wow. That different sections of the rig feed into. But then those, <clears throat> those are then passed back uh, to kind of a computer over here that runs the software that uses those photos to create the 3D models. So it creates a point cloud. And it's basically uh, using geometry. It matches each camera slightly overlapping images Right. And they're not looking at the whole body. So only a few of the cameras are actually looking at the whole body. Most are just looking at tiny portions of the body zoomed in as close as they can be. Like a mosaic. Yeah. And then the software's trying to work out <coughs> what pixels correlate, so from this camera to this camera, mm -hmm. and then basically triangulate what point in space that pixel exists in to create a point cloud. And then it creates <coughs> a three dimensional point yeah. cloud. So this is photogrammetry. Yes, exactly. Okay. That. Yeah. Now, this doesn't quite look like a thing you could point to at a picture in a catalog and a couple of blokes would deliver it. No. <laughs> this, this almost looks like you guys did a lot of the construction here. Yeah, everything that's in here we built, there's no, there's no instruction manual for this either. You know? really? So 10 years ago, we just had to work this out. Uh, and there are a couple of guys kind of in the world back then, 10 years ago, who kind of also working on this. And, you know, they would kindly feed you whatever information they had. Uh, and you just sort of try and figure it out from there. So. And since then, you guys have become part of that drain, brain trust, I imagine? <laughs> yeah, I think I, so. And a lot more people are doing this now, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're literally, when we started building our first one of these, there was one other in the country wow. here, and probably none in Europe. Yeah. I'm not sure if there were any in the States. Probably maybe one in the States. Um, now, as you say, it's standard. Every, every film studio will have one of these in the studio, so when actors come off the set, they'll go straight in for a scan and it's almost a daily thing now. Really? Yeah. So Just to make sure that... Yeah, they get like the continuity of that costume or, you know, f for that day. Um, and it, then all of that feeds back into the visual effects departments who can use that, that data. Um, um, and what about the physical artifacts? I'm assuming once you have this, in addition to making a mannequin that you pattern off of, you'll make parts, but what happens to that mannequin? Does the actor take that mannequin? Does the <laughs> studio take it and hide it away in a vault? Uh, no, uh, mostly. Some, some will go to the studio so they can use them there. Sure. Um, most will use them here and then they'll be destroyed afterwards. Sure. Um, uh, so yeah, there's just uh, this sort of, ceremonial destruction of famous people <laughs> at the end of every job <laughs> in the car park. <laughs> so, um, it's the first time you put this together. I can't imagine it works. Uh, <laughs> and I'm wondering no. if in those early days you found yourself wondering, am I pouring good money after bad? Yeah, and I remember clients saying this, coming <laughs> in, and when we sort of, some of the first ones we built were just kind of head scanner size and uh, and I remember clients coming in, and we, I think one of the early, an early head scan we did with a big celebrity was for Chris Pratt, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the costume supervisor coming in and just looking at it, and he said, 
you, I can see you guys, you're just shoveling money onto this furnace, you know? And it's like, but, but because people hadn't really seen the yeah. technology much here then, and they just kind of see these endless cameras appearing. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's worth it, you know? It, it, the, I just, I honestly don't know how we could do what we do now yeah. without it. In terms so, of your workflow and yeah, the speed. Yeah. Um, you say you're constantly iterating. Do you already know roughly what the next iteration of this is going to be? Yeah, wow. we do. So this one, was one we built, the, so all the hardware that controls this, that fires it, that collects the data, that's all built in-house right. and all designed in-house, all the electronics, again, Simon very much involved there. <sighs> this one, so we would about maybe three years ago, all of that control hardware was built from scratch. Um, and then recently, it's all been upgraded into a cross-polarized cross version. So that's basically filtering out reflected light. So that makes, so traditionally scanning Reflective objects, anything that's shiny, anything that's just completely black or right. white, can be really difficult to do because uh, you're just not, the cameras aren't just able to locate those yeah. crucial pixels that you, because the, any reflected light will just confuse the system. Yeah. Um, so by, by filtering out all that reflected light and trying to just see the object in the middle, it, you get you know, a much better chance of building more difficult scan, objects to scan. But so you're able to you're able to scan more reflective objects now because of that. Yeah, it's wow. not it's not bulletproof. It's yeah. not completely perfect, but <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just stuff stuff you can scan now that you just couldn't even thought about doing before. Amazing. All right. Yeah. So, let's scan. Tell me what to do. Cool. Okay. Well, if you want to just scoot through, uh, and you stand in the middle there. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming this is a tow line. Yeah, that's right. And then there's the all important ruler on the floor because that's <laughs> that's how we make sure the scale. Ah, is, is is correct when when everything's aligned. And oh, built. fast! So. These are the these are the rulers that help you size it. Yeah, so Amazing. yeah, literally just being able to see the millimeter marks on that ruler in the frame is, is yeah going to help us. So let's say I'm a movie star. Yeah. <laughs> let's say I'm a movie star. What would be the first pose you'd ask uh, the actor to do? So I think it would just be an A pose with the arms away from the side and probably legs slightly further apart. Um. Yeah, and um, that's it, and standing straight and tall. Oh, should yeah. I take my glasses off? Uh, uh, you can, you can leave them on or off, but yeah, they're probably better off. All right. So it'd just be a countdown, and it'll be just a very bright flash. Okay, three, two, one. Uh, it's kind of as quick as that. That's it. So do you want to do one in the T pose? Okay, three, two, one. All right, Chris. Hello. Uh, I'm sorry you have to look at my mug for <laughs> the length of time. It's all right. Um, so this is where all the data from 120 cameras comes. Yep. How fast does it take for it to get here from the psh? Usually about 15 to 20 seconds to get, get all the data through. Um, we can take multiple shots. So you could take one shot, then another shot, and another shot, but then that's where it starts to buffer. So you have to give it a minute for it to filter through, and then you can right. start taking more shots again. Um, and what is like, what's the first check you do uh, after a photo that you know, like, okay, we're on the right path? So we've got some cameras that we label reference, usually front and side, mm -hmm. and these will show us the, the APOS shape. So what we're looking for is alignment for hands, alignment for feet, shoulders, head looking forward, slightly up, and we have the side view as well. Nice straight back, mm -hmm. everything in alignment. That would be a pretty good shot to go. Same with the other side as well. I was practicing Alexander technique. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I it. so that's pretty, pretty good. So that's what we look for, alignment, because uh, it's like everything, if you can capture it in the raw data first, then you don't have to do any post-processing, it's, it's true to form. Obviously some people aren't symmetrical. Right. So when you notice that someone is slightly, you try not to force them into a shape. Right. Otherwise the costume is not going to fit, so. Fair enough, I'm actually looking at my big mug up there, I notice how asymmetrical my face is. Yeah, we, we see that a lot. People's faces are asymmetrical. It's just part of nature, so. Um, but yeah, oh, 129 cameras. <laughs> Scrolling through. 
I mean, there are rules for photogrammetry. You sort of like need two thirds of the shot in every other shot. Oh, wow, that's the amount of overlap. Yeah, I mean, that's ideal. You can get away with less, but ideally not. You want to get as much as you can in as many cameras as you can. That way you're going to get a sharper alignment, more polygons, more pixels. Uh, God, I wish I'd yeah. known that years ago. This is, I remember this, John Gata talked about this in his original bullet time, is the most surprising thing to them was the variance in the out-of-the-box store-bought yeah. SLR cameras was like up to a half a stop, I think, yeah. out-of-the-box. You're finding the same thing yeah, still. It, it can be. We've got the same cameras, the same lenses. They can be slightly different. So we have profiles for each lens and camera combination, and we just use Lightroom, we go mm -hmm. approach, uh, and we use the the metadata to select them and color correct. So that, that's, that's not a long process, but when you have a session and you take, you're take taking 50, 60 photo sets, that can now be a long process because that's terabytes right. of data that you're having to color correct and then export out as a JPEG. The software, it can take RAWs, but you tend to get a faster build time with a JPEG. So export them as JPEGs and build it in the software. Right, right. It, does it make it more difficult when someone like me here is wearing a black shirt? Yeah, black shirts, fully, like large pieces of single color material yeah. can be a nightmare and it can make you cringe, but it's, it's interesting since we went cross-polarized, although that black shirt is black, as you can see in that photo, it yeah. is jet black. When you zoom into that, it's yeah. nothing but black. It will pick up dust and our dust is lighter. Wow. So it will actually use the dust particles or any bits of fluff. Yeah. It will use that to stitch on. So Without cross-polarized, that would be a nightmare, but being cross-polarized, that has a good chance to build. That's a surprising, unexpected benefit. I'm... It is, <laughs> it is. Okay, so now they're, once they're all color corrected, you then ask the software to stitch these together into a model. Yeah, so we then take the, the color corrected JPEGs. We have another bit of software that we use called Reality Capture. We send the data into that, and it's, it's a straightforward process in the sense that you click a line and it'll try to align the images I uh, think Grant was mentioning earlier, it looks at every single image and you can tell it to focus on certain areas, like sensitivity levels. Nine times out of 10, it's amazing and works. Sometimes when you have someone with, it can be interesting because it could be very, very geometric patterns that repeat themselves. The software will get slightly confused oh. and then you'll start to get half an object, but then it will stitch the other half and it will start to do a Swiss roll <laughs> and it will start to, build like a Swiss roll shape because it's getting confused as to what parts oh, wow. are what. So it's, that's interesting when that happens, but that doesn't really happen anymore, but that is, is, is a thing. Does it ever happen that you upload all this camera data to the software that's stitching it together and it says, I can use all of these, but these two cameras? Yes. Oh yeah? And that does happen. There are sometimes at the top of the head, like if you look at our body rig, at the very top of our rig. There's that there's, camera. Well, there's no cameras pointing directly oh, down. Yeah, yeah. So obviously it's trying to stitch together as much. So sometimes the top of the head doesn't get picked up as well, um, but we've got plans in the works to correct that problem. And here is the scan. I'm obviously back in my cave. Uh, FBFX uh, collated the data from my scan, sent it to me, uh, turned it into an STL, and we printed this on my big 3D printer. Um, I have a casting of myself at 24, I have a casting of myself at 45, and I have a couple of castings of myself from the last few years. But none of those are truly the correct size of me because when you take a, when you make a casting, the normal way is you cover someone's face with alginate, which is a seaweed-based, quick-setting dental uh, casting material, then you fill that with plaster. And no matter what, when you turn your mold upside down to fill it with plaster, the head that you make gets a little bit fatter. That's just a, a standard thing that's like really hard to get exactly perfectly right. Um, which means that all of my head castings aren't exactly the right size of my head, but this one, man, it's so exactly me, everything works on it. <laughs> Here you go. It's like, <laughs> it's, that to me is hilarious.
Um, thanks to the guys. Thanks to our lovely friends at FBFX for letting us play with their toys and showing us what they can do. Uh, I'm Adam Savage, and I'll see you next time. Hey guys, Adam Savage from Tested here. If you've ever seen the six inch ruler in inches and centimeters on my forearm and wanted one of your own, but you didn't want it to be permanent, well, today's your lucky day. You can now buy temporary tattoos of my measuring stick my measuring forearm uh, at tested-store.com. Comes like this, goes on in about 30 seconds with a little water. The instructions are on the back. It comes off with rubbing alcohol and hopefully it warms you up to the idea of permanently attaching a measuring device to your body because I use mine every single day.